Welcome back. Arguments can be difficult to understand and even harder to assess. In order to do either, we first have to identify the argument's conclusion and the premises that allegedly support it. Then we need to reconstruct the argument using a standard format, specifically one that places the conclusion as the last assertion in the series of statements that compose the argument, preceded by a set of statements that represent the premises, each with its own number and with a line interposed between the conclusion and the premises. So a standard format reconstruction would look something like this. Note that the subnumerals in the premises are consecutive and the subletteral n simply designates the next numbered premise in the series. Here it would be construed as premise 4. The triangle of dots in the conclusion represents the symbol for therefore. For a simple argument, this straight line method of reconstruction works well enough. But for more involved pieces of reasoning, we should consider a different method, namely visually diagramming the argument to capture the complexities of its logical structure, which will often yield better results. Basically, it's a map of the logical relations that the argument contains. Here's how we'll proceed with the mapping. First, each of the propositions in the argument we're diagramming will be assigned a number, just as we would do with a standard reconstruction. We'll place these numbers within circles so that the circled numbers in the diagram represent the propositions in the argument. Second, we'll use arrows between circled numbers to represent relationships of logical support, where one or more circled numbers provide reasons for accepting the circled number that is pointed to. And third, we'll use horizontal brackets to link circled numbers that depend on one another, in the sense that they must be taken together to provide the logical support that they profess to offer to another circled number, such as the conclusion. As with standard format reconstruction, our diagrams will always place the conclusion below the premises so that at the bottom of our diagram we'll find the circled number corresponding to the conclusion. The circled numbers representing the premises will be above with brackets and arrows indicating how they collectively support the conclusion and how they relate to each other. As we'll discover, Premises can be independent, intermediate, or joint, and we'll learn how to depict these relations by considering them in turn, starting with independent premises. Often, different premises will support a conclusion or another premise individually without help from any others. When this is the case, we draw an arrow from the circled number representing that premise to the circled number representing the proposition it supports. Consider this simple argument. Proposition 1, vaccines save many children's lives. Also, Proposition 2, the Center for Disease Control states that vaccines are safer than ever. Therefore, Proposition 3, vaccines should be required for children. The last proposition is clearly the conclusion, as the word therefore indicates. The first two propositions provide backing for it, so they are the premises. They support the conclusion independently, which means that each of the premises would still provide support for the conclusion even if the other were not true. Each on its own gives us an independent reason for believing the conclusion. Consequently, we'll diagram the argument as follows. As you can see, the separate arrows indicate the self-sufficiency of the premises that support the conclusion. The premises are independent, as our diagram shows. The next relation of logical support found among premises is more indirect. Premises provide indirect support for a conclusion by offering a reason to believe another premise that supports the conclusion more directly. That is, some premises are intermediate between the conclusion and other premises. Consider this simple argument. Proposition 1, gay marriage should be legal. Proposition 2, denying gay people the option to marry would be unconstitutional. This is because, Proposition 3, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment guarantees marriage as a civil right for every U.S. citizen, including gays. The conclusion of this argument is the first proposition, so the premises are propositions 2 and 3. Notice, though, there's a relationship between those two claims. 
Proposition 3 starts with the phrase, this is because, indicating that it offers a reason for the claim that precedes it, namely Proposition 2, that denying gay people the option to marriage would be unconstitutional. So, while Proposition 2 appears to provide immediate support for the conclusion, namely that gay marriage should be legal, it ultimately depends upon Proposition 3 for its own support. Thus, Proposition 2 provides intermediate support because it depends on the warrant that Proposition 3 specifies. Here's how we'll map the argument. As you can see, Proposition 2 provides direct support for the conclusion, but it depends on Proposition 3 for its own justification. Thus, it occupies an intermediate logical relationship between the premise that supports it and the conclusion it supports in turn, as our diagram illustrates. Finally, premises provide support when they operate in tandem, that is, jointly. Far from being independent or intermediate, such premises are codependent. In this situation, on our diagrams, we join together the codependent premises with a bracket underneath their circle, circled numbers, as we'll see in our next diagram. There are a number of different ways in which premises can provide joint support. Sometimes one premise is like the key that fits into another premise to unlock the proposition they jointly support. Take this example. Proposition 1, the president will withdraw U.S. forces from either Afghanistan or Somalia. Proposition 2, he won't withdraw from Somalia. Therefore, Proposition 3, he'll withdraw from Afghanistan. Notice that Proposition 1 can't support the conclusion on its own. Neither can Proposition 2. Propositions 1 and 2 need each other. They support the conclusion jointly. And this is how we diagram the argument using the brackets we referred to earlier. Another common pattern for joint premises is when general propositions need help to provide support for particular propositions. Here's an example. Proposition 1. No U.S. president should offer encouragement to dictators who threaten America. Proposition 2. Yet our current president has pra praised Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, both autocratic despots. Plus, Proposition 3, he says he fell in love with the supreme leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. So, Proposition 4, President Trump should immediately cease to court these tyrants. The conclusion of the argument, the thing that it's trying to convince us of, is the last proposition, that Trump should stop courting dictators who threaten us. This is a particular claim. It's a claim about an individual person, Trump. The first proposition in the argument, on the other hand, is a general claim. It asserts that, generally speaking, U.S. presidents should not encourage hostile dictators. It cannot, therefore, support the particular conclusion about Trump on its own. It needs help from other particular claims, propositions two and three, that tell us that the individual in the conclusion Trump meets the condition laid out in our general Proposition 1, namely, encouraging dictators. And this is how we diagram the argument. At this point, you should understand enough about argument mapping to see its advantages over standard form reconstruction. But we won't abandon the latter, since it can be used for the kind of simple arguments we've seen so far. We'll use both, since each has its place in argument reconstruction. Going forward, we'll encounter more sophisticated arguments with additional premises and more complex logical relations. For these arguments, we'll rely on diagramming. More on that in a future presentation. Until next time, best wishes.